All right, sorry that I didn't start that uh, earlier. So um, for those that are just joining uh, asynchronously, the stuff that you missed is just me reminding us that uh, all these lectures and lecture notes are available online um, on Canvas already. And so today um, I want to then have us, um, I'm gonna start out in a small breakout room session where I'll pop around just to hear what people discussing. And I want you to discuss with some other students um, what you would define as the term ecology. I know this is an economics course, but again, these are one of the two few words that start with this ECO prefix. And so I wanna motivate what economics is and how it relates to sustainability by talking about ecology. So I'm gonna put us all into a couple of uh, breakout rooms and um, if for some reason, all right, let me try stopping my uh, share for a second because for some reason, even though I just did breakout rooms in the same room a half hour ago with a different class, I'm not seeing um, breakout rooms showing up here, and but perhaps you, you might yeah. be having a problem since you're the co-host, since Corinne Johnson is labeled as the host. Oh, right, because she's in the in the class right now. Excellent. Thank you for that. Thanks. That's um, that's excellent advice. Well, then maybe if I go back to, um, I can get my mouse back. One second here. I now have an invisible mouse for other technical reasons, apparently. Okay, there it's back. All right, so in my, I'm gonna try in the participants list to grab the host back. That is an excellent observation. I am so happy that you said that. And it looks like I am host back again. Thanks, Corinne, I think you did that. And, um, and then I can now get the breakout rooms back. Excellent, great. So, um, so I will reshare the screen just to have that um, up, but then I think when you go into breakout rooms that will go away anyway. So let's pop into breakout rooms for just a few minutes. So maybe two or three minutes and just to sort of talk with um, the, the say two or three other people about how you would define what ecology is. So um, it doesn't seem related to economics. I promise we'll bring it back. So let's do it now. So I'm uh, created your breakout rooms and opening them now. So what is ecology? All right, so we're back. Um, and uh, so, and by the way, I've, um, I'm trying this new feature I haven't tried before. Where I've spotlighted myself. And so I think what that means is that um, if, if you want to speak up, you don't have to speak up. But if you want to speak up, the camera won't follow you. It'll stay on me. And so this is being recorded. And then that way, the recording doesn't necessarily show you in the speaker view. That's how my interpretation of uh, this kind of spotlight view. So I just wanted to offer that up there. At least that's the intent of what I'm kind of going for here. But you're also feel free to use the chat, the chat here. So I've got the chat up um, and monitoring that. 
So what are some answers here? So what would be your uh, definitions for, and I heard some great ones in the rooms that I got a chance to visit. So how would you define ecology? Does anyone want to offer something up, either verbally uh, over audio or in the chat? I said that it was the study of life. Study of life? Um, yeah, so I think, um, I think biology is sort of what I would say is broadly the study of life. And so I guess what I'm interested in is, is then what's special about ecology? I would say ecology fits within biology. What makes ecology different? Or, you know, like what's, what's like an ecologist different than a physiologist or just a general biologist? Anybody? I heard some people in the breakout rooms bring up things like urban ecology, which I thought was really cool too. So yeah, so anything, um, oh, I see some messages in the chat. And I also heard somebody speaking up. So um, somebody who was about to take the mic, go ahead and, and speak as I read through the chat. They're looking like more at how living organisms and uh, affect their actual surrounding and where they're at within the world or their specific community. That is a very interesting answer. And that kind of goes along with um, some of these other no things I've seen in the chat here, like, uh, uh, relationship of living things to their environment, the network of interactions between uh, different organisms and their environment, the study of living things, the environment, and interactions between the two, um, relationships and balance between organisms and ecosystems, how organisms and um, uh, ecosystems interact with each other and relationships, again, relationships between organisms and the physical environments, how things interact with one another. These are all excellent definitions. and they all seem to involve interactions, networks of things living in places and interacting with those places. And the key thing that I want to emphasize here is it's things interacting in their own environments. The word eco is a Greek word which is for house. And so when we talk about ecology, it is the science of or the study of how things live in their own environments. So if you're an organism in an ecosystem, you got whatever is given to you. You, you know, it's, it's like your genes aren't enough. It's gotta be your genes and your environment. You know, you don't get phenotype out of genotype without the environment. You know, you need to have certain resources that are available. Um, you need to have, um, you gotta have certain things to eat, certain uh, 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 macronutrients, micronutrients, certain uh, accessibility of sun, um, et cetera, et cetera. So ecology is about the network of interactions of things and it necessarily involves an organism in its environment. So once you take that organism and you study it in the lab, an ecologist might say, you might be doing a little bit of physiology, but what you're doing is not so-called ecologically relevant because you're studying that organism outside of its, um, of its natural environment, of its home. And so that's the eco is home, the study of things in their home. So um, so we'll go on to how that relates to economics here in just a second. Um, let me go back to the, um, the screen share here. So I'll share this. Uh. So this also gives us an opportunity to try one of these attendance exercises that uh, we've been talking about. So um, this is how we take attendance each class. And so there is this URL that's out here. If you scan this QR code, you can also get to it. I can also put it um, in the chat. So I'm just going to type the same URL in the chat. And if you are to click on that, it'll take you to a Google form. If it says you don't have access, you need to make sure you log in with your ASU ID. So if it says you don't have access, that means you're probably logged into your Gmail account or some other Google account. And um, if you then make sure that you switch accounts, so that your ASU account is focal, then you should be able to get access to this. And it'll have 10 slots, 10 answers. So in a lecture, I might have one or two or three times, uh, I guess in theory, up to 10 times where I ask an attendance question. And, the, um, and then you just leave this thing up throughout the lecture. And at the end of the lecture, you hit submit. And that'll submit all your answers at once. And then that way I'll have a record that you did that. For those of you attending asynchronously, you've got 24 hours until after the video is posted to submit this. And then I, so basically I'm going to look 
about 36 hours from now, I'm going to look at who's submitted and um, I will pull out the answers that look like they're nonsense. Um, so I'm not grading for correctness, but they have to be coherent answers. And then all the rest of them get attendance credit for today, even if they're the wrong answers, as long as it's a coherent answer. So go to that and the question that I'm going to answer, ask right now, so this is attendance question number one, so don't hit submit, just fill this in the first slot, is um, what uh, term is associated with the prefix eco? So I just, I just mentioned it before. So I'm just driving home, what does this term eco mean? And you can just say if the, uh, there's a, a nice one word way to respond to that. In fact, I could just say it, you know, so it's just an attendance question. I just meant said, you know, that, that you know, when we talk about eco, then, um, you know, that's like the Greek for house or home. So it is organisms in their, their own, their living environments with all the constraints and availabilities afforded to them by their home. It's studying in their natural environment. So it's the study of the home really is what ecology is. So then that um, allows us then to go forward to say, okay, what is economics? So economics is one of the only other words that has eco in the front of it. Some people define economics using ecology. They talk about it, um, you know, with like ecological relationships in, uh, in kind of with human interactions or something like that. Um, but if we want to get more fundamentally, uh, all we've done is change the suffix. So ology, you know, is the study of. And so eek, o, legi, the legi is study, o is of, and eek is home. So it's study of home. Nomics or onomics is the management of. So economics is the management of the home. So um, with economics, the idea is, is how do we study um, how we manage the limited resources that we have available to us? and how do we, Im our impacts on them. So that's kind of the relationship between ecology is studying how organisms naturally deal with limited resources. And economics is how do we manage the limited resources that we're stuck with, because that's just where we live. So it's kind of the management of the home. So that's kind of where the two of them link together. If I wanted to make a more formal uh, definition of economics, I might say the study of how and why individuals and groups make decisions about the use and distribution of valuable human and non-human resources. But I wanna emphasize there, the resources are um, particularly important because those um, resources are, are effectively what's available to you, what, what you have access to. So that's again where that home comes into play. And so when we talk about um, economics, we often divide it into microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics, we're studying individuals and small groups. How do you make a decision when you go out to buy a particular coffee product or a particular uh, food item or car or house? You know, so we are interested in the microscopic uh, decisions of individuals or small groups. So our goals there are to say, well, how do market pressures lead to prices? So how the heck do you get a price on a particular coffee product? And then how do scarce resources get allocated? So um, there's only a certain number of homes. Who gets them? Who gets to live in that home? Who gets to live in that home? So those are questions of microeconomics. And then you have macroeconomics where we're studying the economy as a whole. And so we're focused on aggregated indicators of very large groups. So whenever you hear someone talk about GDP, gross domestic product, you're, you're effectively engaging or listening to someone engage into a macroeconomic discussion. And so in this case, um, the macroeconomics don't tell you, don't tell me anything about um, the decisions I'm going to make, um, you know, after class when I go off to a coffee shop or something like that. But it does tell me that um, the economy as a whole, if you could say that like, if, um, you know, how does COVID-19 affect people's economic activity? We're not focusing on just one person, but as the whole group of people that say live in the United States. We can watch what happens to say the GDP um, when COVID-19 restrictions come into play, et cetera, et cetera. So aggregate, large scale aggregates 
macroeconomics, small scale behaviors, microeconomics. And that's the key difference between the two. We mainly focus on microeconomics in this course because we're interested in what makes people make decisions about how they use their resources. But we will talk about the macroeconomics of sustainability as well. Now there are two other, are there any questions about that, um, about these, um, these two terms, microeconomics and macroeconomics? Is the, uh, is the, this clear, these two, these differences here? And when I get to a formal question slide, and I will put this in the chat right now, um, if there's ever a question that you would like to ask, uh, but um, you uh, do not want to maybe attach your name to it, then um, I put a URL in the chat, and when we get to a formal question slide, that URL will come up again, where it is an anonymous place for you to post questions that everyone else can see the questions that you're posting, and they can vote on them. And I have a console sitting here where I can watch those as well, and as they come in. And so if I have time during class, I can try to answer those questions. If I don't answer them during class, I can post answers on the discussion board. So if you're not comfortable answering a question yourself, you can answer them anonymously at the URL I just put in the chat, and the URL will come up when we get to a formal question slide a little bit later. All right, so no question about that. The other two terms that we need to become comfortable with are positive versus normative, which is particu particularly important when we talk about setting policy. So positive economics is a study of how an existing economic system operates and how it can predict um, what might happen if you made certain changes. And so um, a positive economics is not saying what you should do, but it's saying what's going to happen now that you've done this thing, or what would happen if you did one of a number of different options of things. So what would happen if you raise taxes? Well, here's how the distribution of resources would change if you raise taxes. I'm not saying you should raise taxes, but here's what would happen if you did. That's positive economics. The other type of economics that we talk about is normative economics. Here, we use economic theory to prescribe what generally probably should be done. So here we could say, you know, if you need people to conserve electricity, then maybe you should raise prices. And if you were to raise prices this much, this is the type of conservation you would get and you would achieve your goals. So normative economics tells you the economic levers that you can use to achieve an outcome or positive economics just tells you um, as an analysis of what would happen if you did things. So one of them is kind of more um, descriptive and the other one is much more prescriptive. So those are two terms you see thrown around as well. All right, so economic thinking. So now we know microeconomics, macroeconomics. We know positive economics, normative economics. So now let's start getting into economic thinking. Now I've put a uh, bonus extra uh, homework assignment online. It's a, a totally extra credit, totally optional. You don't do it, won't affect your grade whatsoever. If you do it, it'll throw a couple more homework points into the hopper to help you out later and maybe give you a little extra homework points um, down the line. And that's based on a podcast, a popular podcast about um, economics that happens to be focused on a natural resources problem and uh, an aquifer problem uh, it had to do with agriculture. So if you haven't seen that, check out Canvas. It's a cool little podcast involves some pretty famous economists uh, from the Wharton School, um, uh, Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers, and, um, and they kind of boil things down. They talk about things like externalities and, and um, tragedy of commons and all sorts of things that we're going to get to in this class, but they help motivate this idea of how economists think about these problems. And so economic thinking, why do people pollute? So um, a popular answer, a non-economic answer, is that people are just immoral and selfish. They pollute because they're bad. They're bad people. And um, that's a hard response to that. Because then you could say, well, but why? Like, why is that bad? What set of morals? Like, if they weren't going to pollute, what other activity would they be doing? And like, maybe their pollution has saved a, a million lives. Well, then is their pollution bad? Because they've saved all these lives. You know, it's, it's hard to judge these things in these kind of purely moral ways. And so, um, and then it's hard to also respond with 
policy because you know you, you don't you can you don't know what what to do about these people that are you know that are immoral you know and what sets of morals and all that sort of thing. so this isn't really an economic way of thinking so economists look for a different way of approaching the problem so to for economic thinking why do people pollute people say you know what they pollute because it's the cheapest option they can they have to solving the problem of post-production consumption waste you know so um you know you you've got the napkin or the tissue or whatever and um and so uh you know it's if if you happen to have it in your back pocket clean you use it and then you're standing around there you have an option you could either take it with you or you could drop it on the ground and you can say why does someone drop it on the ground well it could just be that they're a bad person but it could also also be that you know what it's cheap and easy to drop it on the ground and no real consequences to that so they're going to drop it on the ground so it's the this idea it's about incentives about costs about benefits so institutions and constraints determine the cheapest way to solve a given problem if it is Ill illegal to litter if there's a fine for littering then that tells people well, you know what i know maybe they're not going to catch me but if they do i don't want to pay 400 bucks i'm just going to take that napkin put it back in my pocket and the next time we're around a trash can then i'll put it in a trash can and that is because they now had more incentive the cheapest thing to do now became carry the napkin with me until i find a trash or trash can so our policy response is to change the incentive structure to change what becomes the cheapest thing for people to do that is an economic answer to pollution it's not about morals it's about incentives and so um you know a more specific example to that is this nice uh, example this pay as you throw pro pay as you throw payt program which i think is mentioned in the book um, in chapter one and this is um in 1993 there was a budget budget crisis in this particular town which basically said they needed a new revenue source they're running out of money um, for city services and they said all right so rather than making trash totally free we're going to say that you have to buy bags for your trash. And you can buy a $1.50 bag for a 13 gallon or a 75 cent bag for a 15 gallon. I guess I got those flipped. Um, so you know, the different size bags cost a different amount. And the bag, size, uh, the bag sales will support a curbside recycling program. So the people who are throwing away trash are going to be supporting a program to gather and recycling from those who aren't throwing away trash. And hopefully these two things will balance out in a nice way that they pay for themselves. People putting in trash are paying for recycling. And within the first week, recycling jumped up from 2% to 38%. And over the 20 years that they've used this program, um, at least that this has been studied, they raised, um, or they, they estimate they saved somewhere between 10 and $20 million. And so this is an example where by putting a price tag on garbage bags, they totally changed people's behaviors and ended up um, producing an enormous social good to the city. Now you might think, you know, morally like, ah, oh, it's crazy to charge people for trash bags. And that's fine. We're not saying you have to do this. From the positive economic standpoint, we can analyze this and say, well, this is why it happened. We then have to struggle when we talk about for making policy if we're okay with this policy instrument of, of pricing these trash bags, but and then be able to then sort of reconcile with, well, the cost that we're putting on people to charge them for the trash bags, we're making up for in, um, in the amount of money that we're saving the city that could then be used to provide people other types of services. And so you can then start weighing those and we will learn how to weigh those things together as we move forward and start talking about social welfare and how we can kind of think these things from an economic perspective. So that's this idea of incentives driving behavior. Another kind of example of this is that back in um, the 1970s, there was an oil crisis. And that oil crisis um, had a marked change in the shape and size of automobiles. And so um, in these graphs here, you can see it started in 1975. The top graph is the average weight um, uh, and horsepower of a ve of vehicles sold in the United States. The bottom is fuel consumption. 
And you can see that um, from uh, in the 70s going into the 80s, there was a, just a massive fall off in the weight and the horsepower of these vehicles as people were shifting to more economically or fuel, um, more fuel friendly vehicles. And so you can see fuel consumption is also falling off. But then around the 80s, there were advances in technology and there was also a, um, a, a lifting of some of the pressures that were seen in the oil crisis of the 70s. And so if you look back at history, there are things that happened with OPEC in the, around in the 70s as they started to, to really consolidate their power, which created this crisis. And then that started to get resolved and um, new sources of oil became on the market. And so there was less of a crisis in the 80s um, and the technology became better. So you can see that from the 80s on in the bottom graph on the left, um, you get fuel consumption kind of levels out. And then you can then see the weight and horsepower of the vehicles rises right back up to where it was, but with a fuel consumption that is much better than it started with. So there was a plastic deformation, a plastic, I guess, pun intended with the, the, the um, oils here. Um, there was a plastic deformation of the market um, of, of the, te you know, the technology had changed forever. And you can see on the right-hand side here, this is horsepower, uh, horsepower declined. And then um, there was a, a, a rapid rise where fuel economy stayed at some of this kind of sweet spot here. So there hasn't been a pressure um, uh, until you know, through 2006 to make the fuel economy any better. Um, and that's why it kind of stops there. But you know, now we've seen different things happen in the markets. Our fuel economies are getting better and better. So this is an example of how um, things can operate at, um, you know, at a, a background level until there's a change in incentives that encourages people to change their behavior, to find new technologies, to find new ways of doing things. It's all about the incentives. That is the economic approach to thinking about these problems. So um, incentives have play roles. So this is you know, why I'm talking about role playing here. Incentives can produce environmental degradations. Um, so that's, we have to understand how incentives produce degradation. Incentives also can be used to design policies to produce desirable outcomes and behaviors. And so we have to understand incentives from on the kind of positive economic side of things. We have to understand how incentives work. And then on the normative side of things, we have to understand how we can change incentives in order to hopefully get out a behavior that's more desirable and more sustainable. Um, and what's complicated, which is, um, you know, a big problem in economics, is that benefits and costs and their balance change over time. And so there can be a benefit to this generation that produces a cost to future generations. There can be a major cost to this generation that will produce a major benefit to future generations. And so we get trade-offs. We get trade-offs within the generation and we get trade-offs across the generations. And we somehow need to model all of that. We somehow need to model the way in which we think people today care about the way things are in 20 years, in 50 years, in 100 years. No matter how much we say, it's probably the case that people today don't really care that much about the, what life will be like in 200 years. And if you were to sell them that you have to pay an enormous cost today, you have to make your life horrible today, but it guarantees that someone 200 years from now um, is gonna be able to live carefree. Um, I think a lot of people aren't gonna be willing to make that trade. They'd say, well, is there a way that maybe I could not have such a terrible life today and maybe they don't get such a great life tomorrow. So we have to figure out how to balance those two things. And that's something that we learn how to do in this class or learn how to understand in this class. So we have trade-offs in space, trade-offs in time, and we have trade-offs that are changing over time. So in space, I mean within a generation, there's a balance between benefits and costs, and then across time. So in the long run, even in the intergenerational long run, you can have totally different balances of benefits and costs. And you know, these things can constantly be changing over time. All right. So now we get to one of those formal question slides. So if you had a question that um, you could, that you, that you just weren't quite sure that you wanted to attach your name to, you could scan this QR code or visit this URL or go to the URL that I posted um, in the, um, uh, 
uh, in the chat, or if you're happy to just put it out there, you can put a question in the chat, you can speak up, unmute yourself or whatever, and that's fine too. So are there any questions at this point? Can you go back two slides really quickly to the incentives with the arrows? Yes, sure. Um, this one? Yes. I just needed to see the words one more time and submit them. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. and, um, and just my little, you know, keep calm and role play. The idea here is that incentives play different roles. That's what I'm trying to communicate on this slide. There's a, a role they play in producing and a role they play in getting people to uh, to change their behavior. Um, I have a question. Oh, yes. Um, so when you were talking on this slide, were you saying that producing environmental degradation, that would be a normative kind of behavior and the other would be the positive behavior? Oh, okay, so normative and positive apply not to the behaviors, but to the analysis of the behaviors. Okay. So what I was saying is that a normative approach, uh, sorry, a positive approach to economics would say, we're going to look at the current set of incentives, how things currently are, and see how will people behave. And we can say that currently it is way too cheap. Well, I don't want to say too, now I'm getting normative, but I can say given how cheap it is to pollute, okay. it is not surprising that people pollute. But then on the normative economic side, I can say, what if we increased um, the fines for polluting? Well, then now I've changed the incentive structure and then hopefully will then produce a desirable outcome of people not polluting. Okay, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a question just to um, clarify the norm normative and positive outlook for economics. So basically, Positive um, economics is just a way of like currently analyzing things while normative is just a way of predicting it. Normative is, goes a little bit farther. So, so um, positive economics can also um, be predictive. If somebody comes to you and says, what if I change the price of orange juice? Then, um, then it would still fall under um, positive economics to tell you what's gonna happen. Um, okay, so people are going to, you know, there's going to be this many gallons of orange juice will um, will not be, you know, this quantity of orange juice will not be sold. That's still positive economics. What normative economics does is it actually assigns um, a goal. Like it's like um, a pot from positive economics. It's just how are things going to work? I don't have a goal. I just want to know, like, if I change the speed limit, what's going to happen? If I change the price, what's going to happen? But when you come at things of normative economics, then you're saying, I want people to drive slower. I want people to pollute less. What economic tools can I use to get people to drive slower, so, to get okay. people to pollute less? So it's basically like goal oriented for normative uh, economics. That's right. All right you are, you. Uh, yes, you're asserting a norm. We want people to abide by this norm. How do we use economics to make that happen? Okay. Any other questions about all these, these terms that we throw around? Micro, macro, positive, normative, incentives? Excellent questions. All right. I see there's only one microphone unmuted, but I don't hear a question. So I'll just go ahead and mute all again, and then we can move on. And if you have any questions, just unmute yourself, speak up, type in the chat whatever you need. All right, so, um, so that's everything I've said so far, even though it kind of had a uh, sustainability slant to it, is basically just an introduction to economics. How do we add the environment to traditional economics? So that's our next step in laying out what we're gonna talk about in this course. And so um, uh, the economy, this is the way a normal economics course, economy, production and consumption, that's it. It's just the economy. The economics of sustainability, we have to think about the raw materials going in and the impact of uh, economic activity back on nature coming out. And so there's two halves of this. The right-hand side, the impact of economic activity, we call that environmental economics. It's that um, what your role as you produce and consume, how are you altering nature? That is environmental economics. Natural resource economics is on the other side of things, which is um, what, do, what do things out in nature, how do they affect uh, our production and consumption? What is the availability of this resource and how is that going to affect 
uh, production consumption. Oil is maybe it's become suddenly way more available. Well, if it becomes way more available, then um, that is going to change the economy. But as we use more oil, we put more carbon dioxide into the air, which affects nature. And so our use of that oil is um, then becomes a question of environmental economics. So what we're putting into nature is environmental economics. What we're taking out of nature and how nature constrains us is natural resource economics. So those are those two types. And so let's drill down into that just a little bit further to give some better, some clearer examples of what these two fields uh, study. Natural resource economics, I'm defining as the economic study of extraction and utilization of natural resources. The term utilization is sort of like, what's the difference between use and utilize? Utilize is you're taking something and you're making it into something new. You're repurposing it. So um, natural resource economics people ask questions like, what rate can I extract for sustainability? What do I mean by sustainability? If I want to guarantee that this aquifer uh, provides water in perpetuity, then at what rate do I take water out of this aquifer to ensure that it can be replenished by the very, very, very slow processes that can replenish the aquifer? Um, if the aquifer goes dry uh, or gets more and more limited, what will that effect, uh, what effect will we see on prices? Um, what is the effect of, um, of uh, uh, regulation on industry? So if I say that, all right, you used to be able to just take out of the aquifer for free, now we're gonna charge you for that. How is that gonna affect the industry? What is the effect of unregulated industry? Okay, um, if, um, if we used to charge for taking water out of the aquifer and now we make it free, how is that going to affect the aquifer? This is all on the kind of the, the, in, the in, input side of this. And so you see um, people who are interested in this, these types of questions usually focus on say forests or um, marine economics or mineral economics. And so these are people who are focusing on different types of natural resources. Then we can also think about energy as a natural resource. You know, the sun is a natural resource, um, for example, or um, you know, oil itself is a natural resource. So there's energy economics. How sensitive is consumption to changes in price? And so we're going to make oil more costly. Um, you know, how is that going to change consumption? And then on the other side of natural resource economics, then um, we can think about land, water, and agriculture. And so. Um, you know, how do people make decisions about how much land that they use and what they do on that land? So, um, so these are all natural resources. These are all tied to either constraints on economic activity or how loosening constraints um, will end up affecting the resource itself. And so there's a little bit of that sounds a little bit like environmental economics, but loosening a constraint is not increasing I mean, it does result in increasing consumption, but I hope it makes sense that like if I put a tax on oil and I remove that tax, that's very different than studying what happens after I burn that oil and release carbon dioxide into the environment. So it's, if I'm just focusing on the extraction, then it's natural resource economics. So there are two types of natural resources we focus on. And we will focus on them separately in this course renewable resources, which have an appreciable uh, replenishment rate. So that means that um, they, within a time scale that is interesting to how we're using them, they could replenish themselves. Uh, so sunlight, for example, we view that as a, um, you can often view that as a renewable resource because you get more sunlight. Um, now, non-renewable resources, um, they have a negligible replenishment rate. That doesn't mean that they don't get replenished, that they're, an aquifer technically gets replenished, but it gets replenished so slowly that we often view the aquifer as a non-renewable resource. Oil, technically, I mean, I got there somehow, right? You know, dinosaurs had to die for that oil. That happens so slowly that we basically view it as a finite resource that doesn't get replenished. So, um, we can think of different examples here um, of renewable and non-renewable resources. Um, maybe in the chat, can somebody give me some of their own examples of what they view as a renewable resource? So just put out um, guesses there. 
I see sunlight, wind, those sound great. Solar, again, that's sunlight. Biomass, so that's an interesting point too. So, um, so these ideas are like biofuels and things like that. These are designed or to be used in a way that's naturally replenishable. So yeah, I would say that that's, uh, that's replenishable. Geothermal, um, ocean current, yeah, these are all things that once we use them, within the time scale of use, we can imagine getting them back. So these are all excellent examples of what I think yeah, would be what I'd put into renewable. What about non-renewable? What are some other examples of non-renewable resources? Oil, that's an excellent one. That's kind of the go-to one. What's another non-renewable? Coal, that's another one, right? We don't get coal. Once you use the coal, you don't get it back for free. Any others? Uh, minerals, yeah, natural metals. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, they don't, the, the, process, the geological processes that produce minerals are super, super slow. So they're basically non-renewable. Natural gas, that's good. I mentioned aquifers. Aquifers, even though um, a cavity under the ground fills up, we often view these water resources as non-renewable because it takes so long to fill that cavity back up. Uranium, yeah, again, minerals. Minerals, all these things the mineral roads use are non-renewable. And then, I, you know, this is an interesting comment. They said, marine life the way we are going. I love this comment because it shows that the time scale of interest, so maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll use that as a segue. We can adjust the intertemporal trade-offs. Um, so I, I mentioned that something is a renewable resource so long as it can be renewed within our time scale of interest. If we start consuming so fast that we consume much faster than the resource can be renewed, we sometimes have to take the math that we use for renewable resources, get rid of it, and take that same resource and use math for non-renewable resources. So this idea that our consumption rate can actually move things from the renewable side to the non-renewable side, and maybe vice versa. New technologies might be able to take something that we've always viewed as non-renewable and put it into the renewable bin. So. Um, you know, and this doesn't even have to be natural resources. I mean, this could be, you know, further downstream in the supply chain. I am pretty confident that I always have power available to me as long as I'm willing to pay for it at my home. But you could imagine that, um, that maybe that's not the case, that, um, that depending on my consumption rate, I might use up all my power for the day. That's going to change how I use the power during the day. And so I go from a renewable model to a non-renewable model in how I consume. So. This time scale idea is really what sets it all up. We can set up hypothetical situations where things that would be renewable in one universe will be non-renewable in another universe because of how quickly they're consumed. And so this intertemporal trade-off is really at the foundation of sustainability science. So sustainability is all about the selection of resources and behaviors so as to not jeopardize future generations. We wanna make sure that human civilization is sustainable. That doesn't mean that we're going to, that the future human civilization is gonna be a human civilization that's not using natural resources. We're, humans gotta do stuff. In order for society to continue, it's gotta be a society worth living in, right? So it's not purely about conservation, but it's about finding ways to consume resources to bring happiness and social welfare to society in a way that ensures that the benefits that we feel today are also going to be felt tomorrow, at least to some extent. And so the intertemporal trade-off is at the key to all of this. And again, I put this note, sustainability does not mean that resources go untouched, but they're used in a way that ensures that resources will be available to future generations. All right, so that was natural resource economics. Before I move on to environmental economics, are there any questions about natural resource economics, about this idea of what natural resource economics is, this subfield of the economics of sustainability? Is this clear? It's about the extraction and then the production of things like uh, you know, byproducts of our production. That is held in the environmental economics. Yep. Uh, can you elaborate again of what the intertemporal uh, trade-offs are again? 
Right. So this um, continuum that I've put down here um, is just this idea of, uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. And I'm sorry this wasn't more clear. So um, it's this idea that your behavior, um, when there's a strong intertemporal trade-off, what that means is that your activity today is going to prevent you from engaging in that activity or someone else from engaging in that activity tomorrow. And so when there's a strong intertemporal trade-off, then the trade-off means that my decisions now constrain decisions later. When there's a weak intertemporal trade-off or no intertemporal trade-off, then that means that I can make any decision I want to now and later generations or me later can make whatever decision that uh, generation or me wants later and it has no coupling. So when there is a strong coupling across time, we say there is a strong intertemporal trade-off. When there is a weak coupling across time where you can make any decision now and any decision later and the two don't interact, then there is a weak intertemporal trade-off. All right, Does that help? You. Yeah. I see, can the idea of, uh, of time and natural resources be used in other uh, renewable uh, energy sources? Yeah, I mean, I think my, my definition of a renewable energy source is really built on time. It's that in the time scale of your consumption patterns, can you guarantee that you will have um, that, that same amount of resource will be available so that you can kind of continue that activity level. If that can be taken for granted, then it is a renewable resource. So, um, so that's, um, so like, you know, I, I guess, I'm trying to think of a fantastic example, like solar. We all think of solar as a renewable resource because it comes down on this from on, a, on, a, on high. Now let's say that we converted all of the solar energy into electricity and then use that electricity for all sorts of stuff. That solar radiation would not be heating the earth anymore. Think about all of the things that would, that would be affected by not having access to that solar energy. So now we have now created an intertemporal trade-off. So even though the sun keeps coming down on us, if we're collecting all of it and using all of it, then it affects things in a, system, in a systemic way so that all of the other services that the sun provides cannot be provided because we are gathering all of the sunlight. If you've heard of a so-called a Dyson sphere, um, people would sort of predict that in a, a future civilization, they could maybe surround their solar system with a giant uh, capture device that would capture um, all of their solar systems or all of their systems sunlight from every single angle so they could get all of it so that light wouldn't end up going off into far-flung places. And, um, and the light that is, that is their gathering is light that isn't coming, from, uh, coming to us here on Earth that we can observe. So that just kind of goes to show that, that um, so far, there is plenty of sunlight, that we can put solar panels on our roof, and yeah, maybe the ground will be a little cooler because the sun won't uh, radiate you know, the Earth ground as much, and some of that heat will then be converted into electricity or be it'll be instead of being converted into heat it'll be converted via the solar panels to electricity um, but no big deal eventually it'll be a big deal eventually solar will engage an intertemporal trade-off eventually whether you turn your solar collection on or off will affect whether there is enough energy for say grass to grow or plants to grow and things to eat those plants so when we are not engaging in an intertemporal trade-off, then we have a renewable resource. But the instant where your consumption of that resource is going to affect um, choices later, <clears throat> we have an inter we have an intertemporal trade-off, and your renewable resource becomes non-renewable. It becomes something that we need to start budgeting as if it was finite. Does that help? Great. All right, any other questions about this um, natural resource economics? Wait, I have one more question. Yep. Okay, so with just to like reiterate with a strong intertemporal trade-off, that's when your decisions will greatly affect future generations. You've got it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so 
Now let's look at the other side of it, what's coming out of the, uh, of the economy, environmental economics. Um, so um, here, it's the study of, it, of the impact of economic activity on the quality of the natural environment. And there are resources associated with environmental economics that we call environmental resources. Now, these are not substances that you can necessarily hold um, like a natural resource, um, but they're similarly limited. Let me give you some examples. And so one of them is so-called assimilative capacity. You may have heard about this, some of your other courses, maybe not, that's fine, if not, it's the ability of a natural system to accept certain pollutants and render them benign or offensive. And I'll give a concrete example of this, I think, in the next slide. And so the ability of a lake, for example, to take in phosphorus, eventually um, it takes in so much phosphorus that the lake becomes uh, unable to be used in the ways in which humans would like to make use of that lake. And so you now, um, so it, it, it the, when you have safety, so when phosphorus is going into the lake, but the lake is staying safe um, for drinking water and for recreation and all that, we have a symbol of capacity left. But as we start dumping more pollution into the lake, the symbol of capacity, the ability of us to use that lake goes down until eventually goes to zero and we can't use the lake anymore. Biological diversity is another example of that. It's not a physical thing we can hold, and I'll give a concrete example of this, uh, but it's this abstract thing that we can measure. And as we change the environment, we change the diversity of organisms in the environment. And eventually that biological diversity may end up um, uh, uh, moving in a direction that is costly uh, to our future consumption. So assimilative capacity. So here's an example where um, we have uh, these different lakes, so down at the bottom here, and on all of them there is a water quality standard of 7.2 micrograms per liter of phosphorus. So in other words, if you've got more than 7.2 micrograms per liter of phosphorus, then your water is now, um, you don't have good quality water anymore. You cannot use that water in a way that is safe for most human use. So this threshold of 7.2, which you can see with the seven here, this um, creates um, this so-called assimilative capacity. So the green stuff above here is a buffer. So what we're saying is really, um, we probably can get away with eight, but we're gonna reduce it to 7.2 as our standard, just as a buffer. And we can see that in this one lake where it's at 7.1, that basically um, we have no assimilative capacity anymore. You cannot put any more pollutants into that lake. If you do, that water will become unsafe to use. But Meredith Bay only has 6.3 micrograms per liter. So there is a 0.9 assimilative capacity left over. So it is a resource. There is still some of this resource left. It is an environmental resource, assimilative capacity. It's like a thing that's in the lake that we can mine. And so to reduce the assimilative capacity means putting more phosphorus into the lake. So some of these other lakes like Pagas Bay um, have far less pollution into it, which means there's far more assimilative capacity left over. So an environmental resource is almost this invented resource, which is created by a metric of safety. And we view it as a resource because if we needed somewhere for the phosphorus to go, it would be safe for us to put it in that lake. At least it, we put it in Pagas Bay, but it would not be safe for us to put it into this Waukewarn Lake. And so um, this, um, so it, it is a resource that can be exploited just like a natural resource, but it is an environmental resource because it is not like a physical thing that we mine out of the environment. Another example of that is biological diversity. So, a biological diversity is an environmental resource where you can imagine two communities. These two communities all have the same types of animals in them. So you can see there's elephants, there's lions, uh, giraffes. There's, you can see all of the same types of animals are in here. But they have a different biological diversity. If you look at the one on the left, the community on the left, there are a lot more elephants and a lot fewer of everything else. On the right, there's kind of an equal balance of all of the different types of animals. We, there are a number of different metrics of biological diversity, but almost all of them would rate community two as having more diversity than community one. 
Now there are values um, for, uh, you know, there, there's, there's reasons why biological diversity might be a good thing. Maybe it has to do with how res resilient the system is to future shocks and things like that. Uh, but maybe abundance um, of a particular uh, organism is really important to you. And so um, maybe um, you, you, instead of measuring biological diversity, you measure, you know, how many giraffes are left. So these how many questions, these metrics, we can view them as also types of environmental resources. And so one community might be viewed as having more of that environmental resource. So community two has more biological diversity. It has more of the environmental resource. If we're going to stress a system, it might be better to stress community two because it has more diversity. Now it depends on the type of stress. If the type of stress is, um, you know, poaching of elephants, then we think poaching of elephants might be more uh, detrimental to community two than community one. So maybe then the environmental resource is, um, you know, in that case, it's almost more like a natural resource problem because it's like number of elephants. But I'm just trying to get to you this idea of, of we can invent metrics that are abstract, that are not physical things you can mine in the environment but we can treat them as resources on which we can measure different types of uh, organizations. All right, and there was a question, um, a private question to me about um, having trouble hearing me, um, uh, but it looks like it was resolved. So I hope everybody can, can hear me right now. I hope I've got the right microphone turned on. So um, let me know if you can't hear me. All right. So that's um, those two environmental versus natural resources. So um, the depletion of one can lead to the depletion of another. So um, let's, let's see, how are we doing on time here? Um, and then also let's, so let's uh, think about these two questions here. An example of decrease, uh, so, I'm looking for is um, let's break out into breakout rooms for about you know, two or three minutes and try to come up with an example for one or both of these. So can you think of a, a case of where a decreased natural resource can lead later to a decreased environmental resource? Or can you think of a case of a decreased environmental resource leading later to a decreased natural resource? And so um, I'll uh, maybe see if I can put these two questions into the chat or um, I basically just put, uh, I'll just put in the chat as the question here. Send back to everybody. Oh, everybody that um, I'm looking for examples of a decreased natural resource leading to decreased environmental resource or decreased environmental resource leading to decreased natural resource. So let's go in out into breakouts uh, one more time. Um, and uh, for just a couple of minutes and then we'll come back and we'll see what your answers are. So I'm going to open uh, rooms and see you in a second. Oh, hey, Jeremy. So I was thinking if there was a depletion of like water around um, some natural reserve, that would lead to like a decrease uh, like bison or other.
All right, so everybody should be brought back now. And um, so uh, do we have any volunteers here? Um, I heard a lot of people uh, were asking me as I was popping around, um, you know, like, you know, they're still not quite clear on what's the differences here between these two. And that's exactly where we're supposed to be right now is that we're actually trying to figure that out. So does anybody have any good guesses or I, examples of what they think? Go ahead. I might have an example. Um, maybe like if we use too much of the water resource, like from a river or like a, um, a watering hole, we use up like all the water where it's completely dried out. Animals in an ecosystem don't have access to a water source, so they just die off. Be it like okay. the, the, envi the, um, like the environmental resources, resources like the animal variation, which is like go down significantly if there's no water source. I think that's an excellent example. Which one is the natural resource and which one is the um, uh, environmental resource? The natural resources would be the watering hole and the environmental resources would be the animals. Um, I'd say the, nat the, 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 <clears throat> the water in the watering hole, that is definitely a natural resource. The, um, the, the environmental resource would be something a little more artificial like uh, the amount of biodiversity um, in the area. So if mm -hmm. I reduce oh. my natural resource, then I reduce biodiversity. So that's an example there. Okay. I see some other, <clears throat> um, I see deforestation impacting clean air. Um, <clears throat> that's another great one. So if I, the number of trees in uh, a tree stand, for example, that's a natural resource, but um, the amount of clean air we have, like what does it mean to be clean air? That's an environmental resource. There is a a quality standard for our air. And if we pollute more and more, we're effectively using an environmental resource. Like clean air is a resource, but because it is, and, but we could say, but we don't need the air to be as clean as it is. And so we can pollute a little bit and that's using some of that resource. So that's an environmental resource. For the sake of time, I'll just um, maybe, you know, move on from here, but here are two examples that I had, and I think we already covered it, is that increased timber cutting can reduce environmental quality because it can decrease biodiversity or the ability to filter toxins. We already kind of talked about that. But similarly, on the flip side of that, increasing pollution can lead to the decreased ability of fish stocks to replenish. So you can reduce an environmental resource like by polluting more, and that will then later reduce a natural resource. But you can also reduce the natural resource like trees, and that'll reduce an environmental resource like how clean the air is. So um, both types of resources are subject to intertemporal trade-offs. Both are of interest to us in uh, sustainability. So in sustainability uh, uh, science, um, what we're going to talk about all semester is about trade-offs, present versus future, different populations, a trade-off to me versus, or uh, you know, how my use affects uh, your welfare and vice versa, competing uses. So I can use the trees uh, for birders, uh, or I can use the trees for timber. And so which one do I choose? And how do I choose when to conserve my trees to use in one way uh, or consume them in a totally different way? And competing policy goals, like is it more important for me to favor biodiversity or is it more important for me to make sure that um, I've got mouths that are fed? So um, human action, sustainability requires human action, so uh, human action leads to sustainability challenges. So we're trying to make sure that humans can continue to operate on this planet. So um, I'll ask for questions here at the end, um, but I wanna get to the, um, the last attendance question here. So kind of gave an idea of where we're going next. Um, and again, I'll open this up for questions. Um, so we already talked about one attendance exercise. And so, um, and so, um, the attendance exercise, the last attendance exercise for today, and then you can hit submit after this, is it, which intertemporal trade-off represents the case of when a decision today prevents me from making a decision tomorrow? Is it a weak intertemporal trade-off or a strong intertemporal trade-off? And so I can put that in the chat as well. Is um, it a weak or a strong intertemporal trade-off? when a decision today uh, prevents me from making that decision tomorrow? Is that weak or strong? 
So just put that into your attendance exercise. I think we only had two. We had the one from earlier and we had this one. Once you've answered both of those, you can hit submit and that's your attendance credit for today. Um, so it's just two so questions that, total then? Just the two questions total for today, yep. All right. And then with that, if you don't have any questions, you can feel free to pop out of the chat room because we are um, at 116 now. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to hang around here. So are there any questions that I can answer? Um, is it, could you send the first question in the chat as well, just to make sure that I had it right? Uh, the, the first question was um, about the, uh, where does the term eco, the prefix eco come from? So what, is, what does eco represent? Perfect, thank you. All right. Any other questions that I can help with? So just, you know, keep these terms in mind, positive, normative, micro, macro, natural resource, environmental resource, um, intertemporal trade-offs, weak and strong. These are the terms that we want coming out of this lecture. I have a question. Uh-huh. Um, so for the example of like decreased environmental to decreased natural, would an example be like, um, one of the main ones that comes to my head is like the bees. So if like we slowly start losing bees like we are now, can't that affect like our natural resources like pollen and stuff like that? Um, I would say that, uh, ah, how about, yes, but with a little bit, so bees themselves are almost like a natural resource, right? I mean, so okay. honeybees are a little funny because they're like, they're like these, this, this domesticated thing that or we carry around with us. It's hard to think of them as natural resources, but they're still insects that are out in the environment. So let's view them as natural resources. But the amount of pesticides that we put out there may affect how many bees are out there and may affect things like pollination and so on. So um, it may be that by killing the bees, um, you end up affecting a bunch of downstream ecological effects. And so the amount of pesticides that are tolerable by bees, for example, that is an environmental resource. That is a threshold that, so long as we're under that threshold, we view that as an environmental resource. As we use that environmental resource by getting closer to that threshold, we make it harder on the bees. As we make it harder on the bees, then we eventually have less bees. And with less bees, then maybe less things getting pollinated and all of those effects, which will lead to less natural resources. So um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Great. I also have uh, one more question, but this is uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the, what do you say, the, uh, the assignment that we have for this week for the chapter mm -hmm. one introduction. This only has to do with the chapter of the notebook or does it have to also have to do with the lecture that we went over today? Um, the, all the, the, the Canvas activities are really directed at the, at the textbook. Okay, so they're meant to help you with the textbook. So if, if I say something that sounds a little funny based on the textbook, but you're pretty sure your answer is consistent with the textbook, then go with the textbook answer because it's meant to help kind of guide you through the textbook. All right, got it. Thank you. Just making sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay, so with that B example, the environmental resource would be just how much like stress the bees can take, like how many chemicals? Yeah, or you could say is how much, um, it's almost how understressed they are. How much more stress can they take is the environmental resource. All right, and then I was, like the example I thought of, I'm not really sure about, is like um, with natural gas, like that would be the, the natural resource. So say you're like taking that out of the ground, right? And then right. there is like a sinkhole and that, you know, sends buildings into it or something. So with like safety, like human safety, the safety of the city be considered an environmental resource. I like that. I think that's, that's, that's an excellent, excellent point. You take away the natural resource, it creates a sinkhole and, um, and that prevents future human activity. And um, yeah, right. that's good. Alexa just interrupted, but, <laughs> but thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Nope. Thanks so much. See you on Thursday. All right. Looks like everybody's falling off. See you all later.